the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So our topic for this seminar, for my portion, is creation-based natural science versus evolution-based scientism. And uh, we see the agenda that we began to follow last night, and we're going to continue with it today. And uh, so we began by recognizing that a science is an organized body of knowledge, and that theology is the queen of the sciences, the science of God, based on divine revelation. And we saw last night that according to divine revelation, the whole work of creation was supernatural, and therefore creation is actually a proper subject for theology and not for natural science. We saw that natural science is, or ought to be, concerned with the natures and interrelationships of created things, not with their origins. And we saw that when natural scientists work within the framework laid down by Catholic theology, their work flourishes. But when they overstep their bounds and embrace materialism and naturalism and try to explain supernatural realities through natural processes, then their science is perverted and it descends into scientism, a scientism which can be and is being used to establish an anti-Christian totalitarian order throughout the world. Now yesterday we saw that St. Peter, our first pope, was inspired by God to warn us against a future challenge against the fundamental doctrine of creation. And it's in 2 Peter chapter 3, next slide, where inspired by the Holy Ghost, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Karen, I think we're on last night because we, remember we changed the slides for today. If not, I can roll with the punches. We can keep going until we get where we need to be. But it's um, the one where we took out some of the slides. Uh, this was the one from yesterday, so we want to go to the other one. Thank you. Just keep praying because our enemy always likes to attack us through technology and we just don't let it get us down. So in a moment, you're going to see a slide with the quotation from 2 Peter chapter 3, where St. Peter almost 2,000 years ago warns us against the revolution that is taking place and that has been taking place for several hundred years against the fundamental doctrine of creation. And what St. Peter says in this prophecy is that in the last days, so he sees this will be far in the future, he says scoffers will come into the church mocking the word of God in Genesis and saying things have always been the same from the very beginning of creation, from the beginning of the universe. In other words, he predicts that people will come into the church and say that the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in the same way from the very beginning of the universe. And St. Peter points out in the very next verse that, of course, this is false. And he says that these people will have to de deliberately ignore the fact that it was the word of God that brought the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain into existence. Not a material process like a supernova explosion. But then he goes on to say that these scoffers will also have to ignore the fact that 
that there was a divine judgment on the whole earth at the time of Noah's flood, so that we cannot even know what the earth was like before the flood, much less what it was like when God was calling everything into existence supernaturally during these six days of creation. And this really is extraordinary because the fact of the matter is that these are the two points that the satanic forces have used to try to destroy the foundations of the faith in the true doctrine of creation. And so what I, yesterday we looked at the dogma of creation as it has been handed down to us from the apostles and how it was beautifully summarized in the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith in the entire world for 350 years, still authoritative, the only one that's quoted in the New Catechism, quoted 20 times, because it gives such beautiful, clear definitions of the dogmas of the faith. And we saw that according to the Catechism of Trent, God created everything supernaturally. He didn't use any natural process. And he created it in six days. And then he consecrated the seventh day. And we saw that the Catechism of Trent taught every Catholic in the world that when God finished creating St. Adam and St. Eve on the sixth day of creation, he was done and he stopped creating new kinds of creatures because he created everything in this entire universe for us. And, and therefore, the natural order of things that we are living in now did not begin until the whole work of creation was finished. Well, St. Peter's warning is people are going to come into the church and say, no, that's not true. Things have always been the same as they are now in this natural order of things from the first moment of the universe. And therefore, we can study the universe as it is now. And from that, we can extrapolate all the way back to the beginning of the universe and explain how everything came to be. But St. Peter says, these people are going to be completely wrong because they're ignoring the fact, not the pious belief, that it was the word of God that brought everything into existence. And then there was a divine judgment on the whole world at the time of Noah's flood. So people who say everything's been the same are deceived and they're going to deceive anybody who listens to them. But today, not only do most of our Catholic intellectuals deny the fiat creation, the supernatural creation of all things at the beginning of time, they also deny <clears throat> that the flood <clears throat> was a global flood. They say, <clears throat> they tell our young people that the flood was just a local flood. And so it's very important to understand that the global flood was in fact global in extent because we cannot understand how the world is today without understanding that event. So what we're going to do is to begin with just a very short review of some theological reasons why every Catholic should believe in the global flood as all the fathers and doctors did. Then we're going to look at some very powerful bodies of physical evidence for the global extent of Noah's flood. Now, the, the first argument for the global extent of the flood is that our Lord Jesus Christ compares it to his second coming. When the second coming takes place, it's going to affect every single creature on earth. But the only event in history that our Lord can compare his second coming to in that respect is the flood. <laughs> 
because the flood affected every single creature on earth when it occurred. Secondly, all of the church fathers testified to the global extent of the flood. And for them, the global extent of the flood was very important because the ark is a type of Holy Mother Church. And just as there is no salvation outside of the church, so there was no life for those human beings or even animals who were not on the ark. We can also say that the ark, especially in our time, is a type of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And God has made it clear that in these times, if we want to be able to survive with our faith intact, we must consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A third reason why we can know that the flood was global in extent is that there are different words in Hebrew and in Greek for floods. But these other words are never used for Noah's flood. For example, when our Lord gives the parable about man who built his house on sand and then a flood came and it washed his house away, the Greek text does not use the word that is used for Noah's flood because that was a local flood. The word in Greek for Noah's flood is cataclysmos. And that's where we get our English word cataclysm. And it is never used for anything other than the flood because the flood was a global flood and all other floods have been local events. And it's the same in Hebrew. Now a fourth reason why we know that the flood was a global flood is because it would be absurd for God to ask Noah's family to spend about a hundred years building an ark for his family and for the animals if God knew that it was going to be a local flood. He could have just told them to move over to the dry lands where the local flood wouldn't go. When we tell our young people these kinds of silly things, this is what makes them lose all respect for the word of God and the tradition of the church because they're not stupid. They know that this is ridiculous, that God would tell somebody to spend a hundred years or more building an ark to survive a flood when it was just going to be a local flood. And why take the animals? when the animals were perfectly capable of just moving away. And in nature, we see animals know when some tsunami or something is going to come. Long before the humans wake up to it, you'll see them moving out of the way. And finally, a local flood would make God a liar because he promises Noah after the flood that he will never again punish the world in this way. If Noah's flood was a local flood, then God lied because there have been countless terrible floods that have taken tens of thousands of lives and caused all kinds of devastation. So this is a blasphemy, really, to say that Noah's flood was a local flood. Now, if everything were sound in our, our Catholic community, I could sit down now. I wouldn't need to say anything more to you. But the fact of the matter is, we've all been conditioned to want the natural scientists to give their imprimatur before we really fully accept what God has revealed and as it's been handed down to us by the church. And I'm going to show you that when we look at the physical evidence it actually fully confirms the word of God as it was understood in the church from the beginning. But we shouldn't need this because what we have in the word of God and the tradition of the church should be sufficient. But if you look at this next slide, you'll see the six bodies of evidence 
that I am going to expound upon briefly. The first isn't really physical evidence, but it's eyewitness testimony from hundreds of people groups all over the world whose ancestors handed down to them a vivid testimony to a global flood. And we're going to see that. And then the second body of evidence is the fact that we find marine fossils of creatures that lived in the ocean on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. Thirdly, the mere fact that we find billions and billions of very well-preserved fossils of all kinds of plants and animals, but 95% of them are marine organisms, is in itself proof of the global extent of the flood. Number four, we'll see that there are sediment layers that cover entire continents and extend to other continents. And there's no local flood that ever has produced set of deposition on this scale in the last 4,500 years. Number five, when we look between these layers, these vast layers of sedimentary rock, we do not see any evidence of erosion between the layers, which tells us that they were laid down rapidly, one on top of the other. And finally, we'll see that wherever we go on the earth, we find oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces which testify to the final stage, the recessive stage of the flood. So let's go through these very quickly. It's very interesting that when missionaries and explorers went all over the world, virtually everywhere they went, the people that they met testified to the flood event and to the global extent of it. And it's fascinating that the closer the people are to the Tower of Babel, the more closely their account resembles the Mosaic account of the flood. As people moved away and time went on, they lost some of the detail that they had received from their ancestors. What's fascinating is these accounts do not only testify to the global extent of the flood, they include all kinds of details that we find in the sacred history of Genesis. That there was one family, that the animals were taken on the ark, that at the final stage of the flood, birds were released to see if the waters had receded, and that the ark came to rest on a mountain. This is very difficult to explain unless all these hundreds of different, different people groups are actually remembering something that truly happened. Here is a photograph of some marine cephalopods fossilized which are found way up on the Himalayan mountains. And we find these kinds of marine fossils on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. Now this is very easy to explain in terms of the global flood because <clears throat> towards the end of the flood, the land masses were on plates and they collided. And when that occurred, there was a massive uplift of all the major mountain ranges all over the Earth. But because the land was covered with these buried marine creatures or somewhere on the surface, when those mountains were uplifted, the marine organisms were lifted up with them. And that's why whether you go to the Andes or the Himalayas or any tall mountain, you will find these creatures that lived in the ocean now uplifted to the tops of the highest mountains on Earth. You will also find formations like the red wall limestone in the Grand Canyon, which is a seven foot thick layer filled with literally billions of nautiloids that were in the ocean. And this graveyard of these marine creatures 
extends for 10,500 square miles over what is now the southwestern United States. There is nothing in the recorded history of the last 4,500 years that could account for this kind of sedimentary deposition. Now the fact that we even have billions and billions of well-preserved remains of all different kinds of plants and animals is itself proof of the global extent of the flood because fossilization requires very special conditions. Even in an area like this, there are animals dying all the time. There are raccoons dying, squirrels are dying, birds are dying, chipmunks are dying. How many of them will turn into fossils? None of them. Because in order to have a fossil, you have to have the rapid burial of the organism so that it's protected from the scavengers and the microorganisms that would otherwise break it down to nothing. Here you have a fossil of an ichthyosaur mom giving birth to her baby, and she was buried in the sediments of the flood. That's why this was preserved. But it's like a snapshot of what happens when fossilization occurs. You have to have very rapid sedimentation that seals off the creature from the scavengers and microorganisms that in the ordinary course of nature just break them down into nothing. Now this is also true of the big creatures like the land, the big land-dwelling dinosaurs. If you go to Montana and you, you go to the areas where there are many dinosaur graveyards, the ranchers will tell you that the normal thing is for these land-dwelling dinosaurs to be buried, jumbled together with the remains of creatures who lived in the ocean, and the ocean is a thousand miles away. And this is the norm. So this is a very striking proof of the global extent of the flood. Now geologists will also testify to the fact that there are sediment layers, like this one shown here, which covers the entire North American continent. And these layers not only extend over entire continents, you can pick them up on other continents. And there are six of them, what they call mega sequences. And here, for example, in the next slide, you can see that this same uh, sedimentary layer that they call the SOC mega sequence covers North America, but you can pick it up in North Africa. Next slide shows how all six of these mega sequences can be found in South America. Now, of course, in the recessive stage of the flood, there was tremendous erosion, so a lot of what had been laid down was eroded away. But you can still see the remnants of all six of these mega sequences over the South American continent. Next slide. Here you see the famous white cliffs of Dover. These are chalk beds, but you can actually follow these deposits all the way from southern England, across Europe, all the way to the Middle East. Now, what kind of local flood <laughs> deposits this kind of material over an area that vast? There's absolutely no comparison between any local flood of the last 4,500 years and Noah's flood, which did this kind of sedimentary deposition. The same thing is true with coal seams. You know very well, you, you look at the road cuts, you see these coal seams, you can follow them all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, but you can pick them up in Europe and follow them all the way to the Caspian Sea. Tell me what kind of local flood could do that kind of deposition over such enormous areas. Next slide. And this slide shows that between these layers of sediment, which then hardened into rock, there is usually no evidence whatsoever of erosion. 
Now, if these layers had been laid, laid down and then maybe a few million years went by and then the next layer was laid down, we all know that there would have been all kinds of erosion that would have taken place. We don't see any evidence of it. This speaks to the fact that these massive sedimentary layers were laid down one on top of the other in rapid succession. And we also find all over the earth what are called polystrate fossils, which, next slide, which extend through many, many layers of sediment. Now, obviously, this tree did not stand there for 100,000 years or a million years while sediment gradually built up around it. It would have disintegrated in the, in the first 100 years. The only way that this tree was preserved is because the sediments were deposited around it and on top of it very, very rapidly. And that's why we find it. And, and we find such things as enormous whales buried in a vertical position <laughs> with all these layers of sediment built up around them. The whale did not stand on its tail for a million years while this took place. It happened very, very rapidly at the recessive stage of the flood. Uh, I mean, uh, during the flood, not necessarily in the recessive stage. And the imp very important point to understand from a scientific perspective is, as we saw yesterday, Charles Lyell, who basically laid the foundation for Darwin by arguing that the sedimentary rocks all over the earth were laid down of, over enormous periods of time, and who created, believe it or not, the time, the categories of geological ages in chronological order that is still being used in the 21st century, he had no facilities for doing real experimental research in the field of sedimentology. Now we do. We have proper facilities where scientists can study how sediments are laid down in the real world. And what we now know is that Lyle and James Hutton and all of these uh, uniformitarian geologists left out of account the most important factor in sedimentary deposition, which is moving currents of water. Next slide. And so, uh, next slide. We now have laboratories like uh, this one at Colorado State and at Indiana State Uver University. There's a world-class laboratory like this where scientists can, they have these enormous, uh, they're like uh, gymnasia where they have flumes and they can control all the variables, the flow of the water, the different kinds of sediment, and they watch how it's deposited. And what we now know is that Lyle and Hutton, next slide, and just tap the key a couple of times, they completely misunderstood how sediments are laid down in the real world because we now know from experiments, next slide, uh, I'm sorry, back up one. And just tap uh, the space bar a couple of times and you should get the animation. That's great, you can just leave it there. What's happening here is that you have a moving body of water and sediments are being laid down laterally and vertically at the same time. So if you look at the slide, the lower corner, the sediments being laid down there, and then at the diagonally opposite part of the slide, sediments being laid down. You see that? Well, when this is said and done, and Charles Lyell takes a walk in the country, he's going to think that the sediment down at the bottom was laid down long before the sediment at the top. They were laid down at exactly the same time. But he does not know that, because he doesn't understand how, sediments were, how the sediments were actually laid down. Next slide. Now, there was an article published in the main geological journal in France by two scientists who examined the Tonto group, which is a very large section of the Grand Canyon, which according to the conventional thinking was laid down over millions and millions of years. Next slide. And what they did was, 
they brought to bear the experimental research in sedimentology that had been done, and they analyzed the sediments that make up the Tanto group, and they show that from the analysis of the sediments, you can see that this whole formation was laid down by an enormous body of water moving across what is now the southwestern United States, and it was laid down in a matter of days. It did not take millions of years. Now, the other thing that very much supports and confirms the reality of the global flood is that when all the mountains were uplifted, if you look at a cross section, you can see that layer upon layer of sedimentary rock was uplifted, sometimes at very sharp angles, and there's no evidence of deformation. They're just beautiful layers all folded in exactly the same way. Well, if they had been laid down one after the other over millions and millions of years, they would have dried out, and when they were uplifted, there would have been shattering, there would have been deformation. You don't see that. What you see tells you, next slide, that when those layers were uplifted, they were malleable because the material had just been laid down by the flood waters. And that absolutely confirms, again, the global extent of the flood and that it happened in a very, very short space of time. Next slide. Another powerful evidence for the flood that you can see all over the world are water gaps. And water gaps are fascinating. They're places where you could be driving on a highway through a river valley and you look at a ridge and you see that there are places where tributaries come into your river valley and the waters feed the river in that valley. But then you see these other places where there are deep notches cut in the ridge and there's nothing going through them. How did they get there? It's very hard to explain this phenomenon in terms of things have always been the same. But if you understand them in light of the flood, it makes perfect sense because when the flood waters receded and went off the continental land masses into the ocean basins, the waters, of course, were carving channels everywhere that they could to get the fastest route to the ocean. But eventually, what happens? The water gets canalized into a few channels. So those water gaps that you'll be able to see when you drive around the country, wherever you go, they are a testament to those first notches that were cut by the waters in the recessive stage of the flood. And now they're there with no water running through them as a relic of that event. And here's another example, next slide. This one, no, I'm sorry, back up one. This is typical of the water gaps that we see, especially when you drive north from where we live in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. You drop into Pennsylvania and you see, and you can see what a deep cut that is in the ridge, and there's no water flowing through it. But that was definitely carved out by the floodwaters in the recessive stage of the flood. Next slide. Now, the other thing that I'm sure you've noticed, which is quite remarkable, is that wherever you go in the world, you see these little pencils of a river flowing through these enormous valleys. Now, that is really very difficult to explain in terms of things have always been the same. But it's very easy to explain in terms of the global flood. There's one geologist who did a study just of this phenomenon, and he concluded that many, many rivers had up to 20 to 60 times their present discharge. That's a pretty significant difference. And so that's why in the Shenandoah Valley where I live, for example, you have this enormous valley and you have this little bit of water running through it. How did that happen? Well, again, when the waters were running off the continental land masses, they would scour out enormous valleys. But when the floodwaters had all run back into the ocean basins, 
you just had these little pencils of a river left as a relic of the flood. And finally, all over the earth we can find enormous areas that geologists call planation surfaces. And this is, these are places where water had such erosive force that as it moved, it, it sheared off and planed all the material to a perfectly flat surface. So you might have a very, very hard rock and then an area where there's a very soft rock, but when those waters moved over, they sheared everything to a flat surface. No matter how hard the material was, it gets planed to the same level as the softer material. That's a planation surface. And to give you an idea of how widespread this phenomenon is, almost two-thirds of the entire African continent is a planation surface. Tell me what kind of local flood turned almost two-thirds of the African continent into a perfectly flat surface. It's, it's absurd to consider that anything less than the global flood event could have left Africa the way that it is. So we've seen, we have eyewitness testimony from virtually every people group on Earth to the reality of the global extent of the flood. We have marine fossils on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. We have billions of well-preserved fossils, 95% of them creatures that lived in the ocean all over the Earth. We have sediment layers that cover whole continents and extend to other continents. We have no evidence of erosion between these layers showing that they were laid down rapidly, one on top of the other, and all over the earth, we have oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces, which are very difficult to explain outside of the framework of a global flood. But another thing that is very important for us to understand in this time of climate alarmism is that only the global flood could produce an ice age. Because during the global flood, and especially at the beginning, there was a tremendous amount of volcanic activity all around the earth. Moses says all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So a lot of water came up out of underwater chambers, but there was also volcanic activity. And you can see the remnants of that in the ring of fire around the earth to this day. And when this happened, the ocean waters were heated up which produced a tremendous amount of evaporation. So the air was super saturated. But then all the particulate, all the material that was spewed up from these volcanoes partially blocked the light of the sun. So the temperature plummeted. And so what happened to all that moisture in the air? It precipitated as snow and ice. And it was something on a totally different scale than anything that had ever been seen before or since, and that's what produced the Ice Age. Now, we were all taught in school that there were multiple Ice Ages, but the evidence really shows that there was one Ice Age that lasted about 500 to 700 years. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before Genesis was put down. Even modern scholars generally agree with that. And Job probably lived only about 400, 500 years after the flood. And his is the first book that mentions snow and ice <laughs> because he was still experiencing the conditions in the post-flood world. But, of course, there were uh, some fluctuations in temperature during that time. So the, the ice would advance and it would retreat periodically. But those weren't separate ice ages. Those were just variations within the one ice age. And this is very important to understand because when geologists today take the ice cores like what they did in Greenland, they totally misinterpret what they are seeing because they think that everything's been the same from the beginning. 
And when they see what seem like rapid variations in, in temperature, they think that this represents some cooling period that lasted a thousand years and some warming period that lasted a thousand years. And that is exactly what motivates them to tell us that we're heading to catastrophe because the small changes in temperature are going to somehow snowball and we're going to either have an ice age or then they will tell us that we're going to have uh, the rise of temperature and that's going to be a catastrophe. It's largely based on the fact that they deny the reality of the global flood and they can't properly interpret what they see because when you go down in the ice cores to the places that are recording the changes that occurred during the ice age, there was ongoing volcanic activity and there were variations in temperature totally different than what we see today, but they were taking place within very short intervals, intervals of time. They're not evidence that by slow changes in temperature, you can end up with this snowball effect and have some you know, cat catastrophic uh, global warming taking place for a thousand years or something like that. So getting back to the truth with regard to the global flood would be a very important step in refuting the climate alarmists. Now there's another thing that's very important to understand in connection with the global flood, and that is it seems clear that it was a high radiation event because it was a cataclysm and there's abundant evidence that there was actually accelerated radioactive decay during the flood. Now, probably we were all taught in school that one of the reasons that we can be sure that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the universe, of course, is so many billions of years older than that is because we have these scientific radiometric dating methods which prove that this is so. So what we are taught is that if I have a rock in my hand and it contains a certain amount of uranium and I know that after 4.5 billion years, half of this isotope will turn into lead and I, I look at the amount of uranium in the rock and the amount of lead in the rock, then I can know that it would take, say, 1.5 billion years for that uranium to decay into lead. And therefore, I know for a fact that this rock is 1.5 billion years old. It sounds very scientific, doesn't it? But what we were never taught in school, unless you were an exceptionally favored student, is that there are three assumptions that go into that calculation, and not one of them is reasonable. Number one, I am assuming that I know how much uranium and lead was in the material 1.5 billion years ago. How could I possibly know that? I can't get in a time machine and go back 1.5 billion years to see what were the original conditions. Assumption number two, I am assuming that the rate of decay of uranium to lead has remained constant for 1.5 billion years. I have absolutely no way of verifying that and I'm gonna to prove to you in a few minutes that it's been falsified, that the rates of decay can, greatly, can be greatly accelerated. And then my third assumption is that for the entire history of this rock, it was isolated from its environment. Now that is totally unreasonable. Uranium is water soluble. Am I supposed to believe that for this entire 1.5 billion years, water never brought uranium into the system? Water never took uranium out of the system? Not only can I not observe it, it's really unreasonable to think that that could have been the case, especially over such an enormous period of time.
Well, it so happens that in recent decades, some very important research has been done that has proven that there was accelerated radioactive decay during the flood. I explained yesterday, and if you go to our website or you get our DVD series, Foundations Restored, you'll get the chapter and verse and the references for this. We saw that carbon-14, which has a very short half-life, which turns very quickly into, back into nitrogen-14, we saw that it's been found in dinosaur bones that are supposed to have become extinct 65 million years ago. But I didn't tell you what is a fact, that virtually everything in the entire rock record that has ever been tested for carbon-14 has carbon-14 in it. Coal and a whole host of other remains of plants and animals contains carbon-14, which proves that this material was deposited thousands of years ago. When a group of scientists took coal from deposits dated from about 30 million years ago to 323 million years ago, and they sent it to be dated by carbon-14 in a lab that has an accelerated mass spectrometer that can calculate the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. Every single sample of coal was found to contain roughly the same amount of carbon-14, which proves that the 30 million year old coal was deposited at almost exactly the same time as the allegedly 323 million year old coal. And of course, that's what happened because all of this material was deposited during the flood and that's why when you do the carbon-14 dating, it all has more or less the same age. Now at the same time, there were, um, there were, there's another phenomenon that was going on and this is what I'm going to tell you about now. There was a tremendous amount of uranium to lead decay and when this occurred in the granitic rocks, as the uranium decays into lead, it emits alpha particles. And each of this is a helium nucleus that's composed of two pro protons and two neutrons. And what happens is these get trapped inside of zircon crystals in the granite, which has a very, very tight lattice structure. And then the alpha particle takes on two electrons from inside the zircon crystal, and it becomes a complete helium atom. So in other words, when uranium decays to lead inside these zircons, helium is being produced. Now, these scientists looked at a very astonishing fact. Next slide. And this has been observed by scientists since the middle of the last century, that if uranium to lead decay had been taking place in granitic rocks for 1.5 billion years, there would have been a tremendous amount of helium produced as a byproduct of that uranium to lead decay. And over the 1.5 billion years, that helium would have gradually leaked out of the zircon crystals and gone into the Earth's atmosphere. But guess what? <laughs> Way back in 1957, a chemist named Dr. Melvin Cook, who's famous for his work in the field of explosives, was published in the prestigious journal Nature and asked, where is the helium? Where's the helium in the atmosphere that's got to be there if the Earth is billions of years old. Because he pointed out that there is only 
in our atmosphere of the helium that should be there if uranium's been decaying into lead for 1.5 billion years. That is a fact. And this gentleman, next slide, has a PhD in nuclear physics, worked at Los Alamos for his whole professional career, and he decided to team up with some other scientists and do some experiments to get to the bottom of this. So what they did was they took zircons from granitic rock that had had this uranium to lead decay and in which there was still a lot of helium. And then they did very careful experiments to see how long ago these zircons could have been formed with the helium in them based on how much helium is still left in the zircons. And what they concluded from the data is that based on the rate at which helium diffuses out of these zircon crystals, it could not have been more than 14,000 years ago. And it could easily have been as low as 4,000 years ago. Because if these rocks were any older than that, more of the helium would have diffused out of the crystals. Now what's also fascinating is that when we were in school, we were given the impression that there are these different radioactive isotopes in the rocks, but if you know how to interpret them correctly, they're all gonna tell the same time. Well, that's wrong. In the uh, granitic rocks in Nevada, for example, geologists normally use the potassium to or argon method to date the rocks. Now, potassium to argon has a half-life of 1.25 billion years. So that means I have a rock in my hand and I have it analyzed and I find that it has a certain amount of potassium and a certain amount of argon. And based on that half-life of 1.25 billion years, I conclude that this rock is a billion years old. What is remarkable is that in that very same <laughs> granitic rock from the Sierra Nevada, I can also find radium that is decaying into radon gas. And radium to radon has a half-life of 1,600 years. Now, the rule of thumb is after 10 half-lives, there's not going to be anything left of the parent substance. So that means after 16,000 years, there should not be one atom of radium left in that rock. But it's still releasing radon gas. Now that's a problem. This gentleman built a house in an area where the rocks are dated to 80 to 120 million years using potassium argon, but he was shocked to discover they have a radon gas problem in that area. And radon is the leading cause of lung cancer, next slide, among non-smokers. 20,000 people die every year in this country from exposure to radon gas. So this gentleman contacted the local geologist who was in charge, next slide, of the radon extension program. And he asked him, why do you use potassium to argon dating to date these rocks to 80 to 120 million years when you know perfectly well that radium to radon is going on and that the rocks are outgassing poisonous radon gas? And this was the answer from the professor at the University of Nevada in Reno who's paid good money to administer the radon extension program. He said, the former was easier, in other words, to do the potassium to argon dating, and listen to this, the latter would, quote, produce too young an age, unquote. So these people, with all of their advanced degrees, 
are so committed to the evolutionary paradigm that they would rather put your life at risk than question that paradigm. Now another objection, next slide, that is raised to this idea that there was accelerated radioactive decay during Noah's flood is that, well, that would have incinerated Noah's family and the ark and all of the animals, so that is impossible. Well, I think it's kind of funny that Almighty God works the greatest public miracle since the resurrection to almost answer, by the way, this objection. And that, of course, was the miracle of the sun at Fatima on October 13, 1917 witnessed by 70,000 people who were not taking LSD. <laughs> and as you know, at the very end of this miracle, there was this beautiful motherly touch from our Heavenly Mother because these people had been standing in a pouring rain for hours. Their clothes were soaked. Their bodies were soaked. The ground under their feet was soaked, and in a second, practically, everything was dry. Now, if you do a very simple calculation, as I asked my friend, Dr. Thomas Seiler, the physicist, could you please do a little calculation, doctor, of how much heat it would take to dry the clothes, the bodies, and the ground under 70,000 people who have been standing in a pouring rain for several hours? He said, of course, they would have been completely incinerated. So the same God who preserved the 70,000 people at Fatima from being incinerated was the same God who preserved Noah and his family and the animals from the accelerated radioactive decay during Noah's flood. Not a problem. And of course, the miracle of the sun was done to prove that the message of Our Lady of Fatima was urgent and true. And she told us that war is a punishment for sin and that if mankind did not repent and if her requests were not heeded, Russia was going to spread its errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Well, it so happens that the Bolshevik Revolution took place just weeks after the miracle of the sun. And what many people do not know is the principal error that really took hold in Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution was not communism. It was evolutionism. Because Lenin had been brought up in an Orthodox Christian home, but he became an atheist and a materialist because he read Darwin and the evolutionists, and he thought that science proved that materialistic evolution was true. That's why he could be a confident atheist and a confident communist. On his desk, next slide, and the next one, he had this sculpture, a chimpanzee sitting on a pile of books, one of which is Darwin's Origin of Species contemplating a human skull. And under the foot of that chimpanzee is the blasphemous saying of Satan, you will be gods. And as Lenin sat at his desk contemplating this monstrosity, he authorized the murder of millions of his fellow countrymen because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. After Lenin came Stalin. Stalin was educated in an Orthodox seminary in Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia. But he read the works of Darwin and Lyell, became a convinced evolutionist, convinced atheist, then convinced communist, went to the other seminary and said, you have to read these books. The Bible's a pack of lies. We're descended from apes. There is no God. And he was responsible for the murder of 20 million plus human beings because they stood in the way of evolution to the communist utopia. Well, the Blessed Mother said the errors would spread. 
and the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of the Chinese communists. Mao Zedong said emphatically, the foundation of Chinese socialism rests on Darwin and the theory of evolution. Next slide. This is Bishop Cuthbert Ogara, a passionist missionary bishop in China who watched as the communist troops came into his diocese. And in every single town, they would force all the adults into a hall for a seminar. Next slide. So he wondered, what is this seminar going to be? Is it going to be Marx? Is it going to be Lenin? Is it going to be Mao Zedong? It was always the same. Next slide. It was on evolution. You are a product of a material process of evolution. There is no God. There is no soul. There is no afterlife. Because they knew if people would accept this, then they could easily accept the rest of the communist mumbo jumbo. Next slide. Hitler said, the purpose of the Nazi party is to bring evolution to the next stage. He had the support of the overwhelming majority of the German intellectual elite because they were all convinced evolutionists. Next slide. In fact, this was true long before Hitler came on the scene. The first genocide of the 20th century was not the Armenian genocide. It was the African genocide. Because in the scramble for colonies, the German military leadership took over large areas of Africa, especially Namibia, and they practically wiped out entire tribes because they considered them like missing links between apes and humans who could just be slaughtered if they didn't do exactly what they were told. Next slide. Mengele was typical of the German intellectuals who thought that it was perfectly legitimate to do experiments on living human subjects in Auschwitz because he reasoned that if I take a less evolved person, like a gypsy or a, a, a Slav, and I strip the person naked and I put them in freezing cold water and I watch how long it takes for them to die, I can use that valuable scientific data to help my more highly evolved Luftwaffe pilot so when he gets shot down over the North Sea, we can help him to survive. That's not wrong. That's just doing evolution in the lab. And of course, Margaret Sanger jumped on the evolution bandwagon because she saw that with birth control, governments could prevent the less evolved people from reproducing and only allow the more highly evolved people, like herself, of course, to reproduce and then we would be able to get rid of, in her charming phrase, the dead weight of human waste. But it gets worse. Here in the US, Kinsey was educated in a devout Protestant home. But when he went to university, he was taught evolution, lost his faith, became an atheist, went to Harvard, got a PhD, and then founded a new science, the science of perversion. And basically, it boils down to this, that back in the Middle Ages, we had this antiquated notion that God created man as man and woman as woman. And from the very design of their bodies, we can tell that there are some kinds of behavior that are natural, normal, and good, and other kinds of behavior that are unnatural, abnormal, and evil. Well, Kinsey says, thanks to evolution, we're liberated. Because now we can look at our cousins, the bonobos and the chimpanzees, and we see that they do all this behavior that back in the Middle Ages we thought was unnatural and abnormal. Now, thanks to evolution, we know that it's really natural, normal, and good. And so, armed with this pseudoscience from hell, he went to the Rockefeller Foundation, got a big grant of money to begin the scientific study of perversion in which he took people who were afflicted with different perversions, mostly from prison populations, had them do their perversions, wrote up what he saw, made it seem that this was much more common 
in the general population than it was, and then got the criminal code changed, and the medical code changed, and the psychiatric code changed. So today, there are many places where you could lose your license or go to prison if you do not say that what is unnatural, abnormal, and evil is natural, normal, and good. And this pseudoscience from hell has entered into the very citadel of the Catholic Church. Right here in the Midwest, at the height of the clergy abuse that was going on, that wasn't being reported yet. Father Anthony Kosnick was the rector of a Catholic seminary, preparing future priests and bishops, forming them. And in an article that he published at that time in the journal of the Catholic Theological Society of America, he, he stated this. At this time, the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be empirically demonstrated to be of itself in a culture-free way detrimental to a full human existence. This is the complete diabolical inversion of the right order of the sciences. Theology is the queen of the sciences. She is the one who should tell the lower sciences what are their boundaries and what is right and what is wrong. Here we see the rector of a Catholic seminar, seminary saying that the empirical scientists can dictate to the theologians and the philosophers what is right and what is wrong. And this is where it led. Cardinal Baldessari was made the moderator of the Synod on Marriage and the Family a few years ago in Rome. And when he was asked by members of the press, Your Eminence, how can you be spending so much time trying to find a way to give Holy Communion to active homosexuals or to people who were married in the church, got divorced, married outside the church, and now they feel excluded and they want to be able to receive Holy Communion? When in the entire history of the church, this would never even have been considered for one moment. This was his answer. There's no reason to be scandalized that there is a cardinal or a theologian saying something that's different from the so-called common doctrine. This doesn't imply a going against. It means reflecting. Because dogma has its own evolution. That is a development, not a change. Even Cardinal Pell, may he rest in peace, who was looked up to as one of the few cardinals who tried to uphold the traditional understanding of holy marriage, even he was deceived by evolutionary pseudoscience. And in a televised debate with Richard Dawkins, the world's leading atheist, back up one please, atheist, evolutionist, in the entire world, Cardinal Pell said this, the account of Adam and Eve is a very sophisticated mythology to try to explain the evil and the suffering in the world. It's certainly not a scientific truth. It's a religious story told for religious purposes. Next slide. Well, Richard Dawkins had a field day with that. He said, so the story of Adam and Eve was only symbolic? So in order to impress himself, Jesus had himself tortured and executed in vicarious punishment for a symbolic sin committed by a non-existent individual? I don't want to know how many Catholic young people lost their faith from watching that debate. And it was totally unnecessary because at that very moment, cutting-edge natural science had already proven that the sacred history of Genesis was 100% correct. Between the two sessions, next slide, of the Synod on Marriage and the Family, we teamed up with Human Life International in Rome to put on a symposium to show that the special creation of Adam, body and soul, and the creation of Eve from Adam's side at the beginning of creation is still the foundation of the church's teaching on holy marriage and the family, and that it is totally confirmed 
by sound theology, sound philosophy, and sound natural science. And to that symposium, at his own expense, came one of the most famous plant geneticists in the entire world, Dr. John Sanford from Cornell University, with 30 patents to his credit. And Dr. Sanford proved to this assembly that convened with the explicit blessing of Cardinal Raymond Burke, that the proof that we are all descended from St. Adam and St. Eve is in our DNA. Next slide. And next slide. First of all, he showed that scientists have studied the mitochondrial DNA that is passed from mother to daughter in every major people group all over the world. And they were astonished to find that whether they were looking at the mitochondrial DNA of African women, Chinese women, Eskimo women, whatever group, it was almost exactly the same. What also astonished them was there were so few mutations in the mitochondrial DNA because most of the scientists were working within the evolutionary framework and they thought that many more mutations would have built up over the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Instead, they discovered that the average woman is only 21 mutations removed from the mother of all the living. Now, he went on to show, next slide, that if you take the observed empirically derived rate of mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, and you take a standard generation time, and you do the math, you can conclude that mitochondrial Eve, the mother of every woman on Earth today, only lived about 6,000 years ago. Next slide. He then went on to show that exactly the same thing is true of men. Scientists had studied the Y chromosome that is passed from father to son, and once again they were amazed that whether they were looking at Africans, Chinese, Europeans, Eskimos, Aborigines in Australia, the mitochondrial, the, the Y chromosome was so homogeneous. And there were many, many fewer mutations in the Y chromosome than they had expected given their evolutionary time scale. And if you take the observed rate of mutation in the Y chromosome, which is about one mutation per generation, and you take a standard generation time and you do the math, you can calculate that Adam, St. Adam, also lived about 6,000 years ago. Now, obviously, this is not an exact science, but the point is, these numbers are totally within the biblical chronology framework, but they are totally out of the evolutionary ballpark. They don't have anything to do with any of the predictions of the evolutionists. Do next slide. Dr. Sanford went on to show that if you take the lifespans of the patriarchs recorded in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, and you put them on a graph, they are 100% in accord with cutting edge 21st century genetics. You have St. Adam created in genetic perfection at the beginning, then after the original sin, the bondage to de decay begins, the harmful mutations begin, but he still lives to be 930 years old. Each succeeding generation accumulates more mutations. And so you see the lifespans begin to decline. But at the time of the flood, there's a precipitous decline. And he pointed out this makes perfect sense because all the mutations that had built up in the eight members of Noah's family were now fixed in the human race forever because everyone in this church is a descendant of Noah's family, of course. But we also know that the flood was a high radiation event and there was probably residual radioactivity afterwards which would have increased the rate of mutation to some degree. Now, it's tragic that if our children or grandchildren go to a Catholic school or university and are even given this information, 
which many of them are not, they are not being told as they should that this confirms the sacred history of Genesis as it was always believed in the church. On the contrary, what most of them are being told is, students, please do not think that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve have anything to do with what we read in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. No, students, what happened was this. There were hundreds of thousands of years of evolution leading up to this point, and then there was a combination of factors, maybe tribal warfare, pestilence, natural disasters, and the population was reduced down to a tiny number of people, and that's why everyone on Earth today is descended from Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Now, if I'm a student in a Catholic school and my teacher is telling me this, I'm just going to put it in my notes because I want to get an A on the test. But it's nonsense. Because Dr. Sanford, next slide, pointed out that it is a fact that no geneticist denies that we are accumulating mutations in the genome at such a rate that if there had even been 10,000 years of mythical evolution before Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve, they would probably have been so mutant that they wouldn't have been able to have a single viable offspring. And here's another thing that he shared, and you can read the article, God, Family, and Genetics on the Kobe website and get the details. But Dr. Sanford points out that we have discovered that the information in our DNA sequences is so dense that there is no human being or computer on Earth that can compare with the author of that information. Because a DNA sequence in your body right now can be read in this direction, and it will have one message to tell some little molecular machines what to do. The very same sequence can be read in the opposite direction and gives another direction, different one. Then he shows there are also ways that you can read every third letter and get another functional message. And then he says there's also a way that in our cells the same message can be read, translated into a different language, and it gives another direction. So the next time you're talking to an atheist, you can, in a friendly way, say, well, of course, we all know that we have coded information in our bodies. And he'll say, well, yeah, of course, everybody knows that. And you could say, well, and of course, you're up to date on the latest research, so you know that the DNA, DNA sequences in your body right now, they can be read in this way and that way. And according to you, this all happened through a material process. There was no intelligent God who did this. So I just have a, just a simple kind of fun thing that you could do. Just go home tonight and just write one sentence for me, just eight words. I just want it to mean something going this way, and I want it to mean something going the other way. I'll see you in the morning. Because our atheist friend is going to have a very sleepless night. He's not even going to be able to make a sentence of eight words that makes sense going forwards and backwards when every cell in his body <laughs> contains information that is practically infinitely more complex than that. But you see what this means is that mutations are always harmful. Because if I have a sentence that only can be read this way, sure, I could make a little mistake. It's only messing up that one meaning. What happens when your mutation changes information that is this densely encoded? you're doing harm every single time. It's unavoidable. And Dr. Sanford points out, everyone in this church accumulates 
100 unique new mutations in the germline that will be passed on to offspring. And this is resulting in an inexorable degradation of the human genome. So contrary to what Father Teilhard and his disciples are telling us, we are not evolving into Superman. We are devolving. And therefore, the theory of evolution, so-called, it's gone, it's finished. And of course, this confirms what St. Thomas and all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers taught in their authoritative teaching, that God created everything perfect in the beginning. And since the fall, everything has been degrading. I'm sorry, next slide. And I just keep going until you get to the one that shows uh, Dr. Nathaniel T. Jeanson at the top of the slide. Perfect. Dr. Nathaniel T. Jeanson has a PhD in developmental and cell biology from Harvard University, and he has done some additional research from the scientific literature on mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, not only in humans, but also in fruit flies, roundworms, and water fleas. Now, in the evolutionary literature, the origin of modern humans is said to have occurred about 180,000 years ago. Fruit flies are said to have appeared on the scene 20 million years ago, roundworms about 18 million years ago, and water fleas lagged behind only about 7.6 million years ago. Next slide. Well, guess what? From the scientific literature where we can discover the actual number of DNA, of mitochondrial DNA mutations in all of these different kinds of creatures, we find that the actual number is perfectly in line with the prediction you would make if God created all things less than 10,000 years ago. But it is totally out of the ballpark for all of these organisms if you work within the evolutionary framework. And that brings me to the last scientific topic I'm going to cover and then I have to finish. Because of this evolutionary framework and the abandonment of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. Believe it or not, the consensus view in biology in beginning in the 70s was that since only 2% of our DNA codes for protein, the other 98% was junk that was left over from the millions of years of evolution. This was the consensus view. Next slide. And Richard Dawkins, uh, use this as proof that evolution is true. How can you be so stupid as to believe in an intelligent creator when 98% of your DNA is junk? I don't want to know how many Catholic young people lost their faith because of this nonsense. Next slide. Well, when Project ENCODE got funding to study the so-called junk DNA, next slide, they found out, of course, that it's not junk after all. In fact, it operates at a higher level than the DNA that codes for protein. And as we saw last night, it actually, tell, it actually serves, in many, many cases, to turn off or turn on very sophisticated genetic programs, as we saw with our friends, the crested anole lizards in Puerto Rico, who in just a few generations grew very long legs and special appendages so they could climb up walls instead of on trees as their ancestors had done. All of this was because the junk DNA was activating these programs that already were written into the genome by our creator. Well, John Maddock, who was one of the pioneers in the uh, investigation of the functionality of the so-called junk DNA, said that this failure to recognize the functionality of the non-coding DNA, he said, it will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Yes, but who was responsible? 
He wasn't the scientists and medical researchers who believed in the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. They all knew that the junk DNA was going to prove to be fully functional. And here's the scary part that I have to tell you before we finish, before I finish. Because 100% of the members of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences are evolutionists, they think that we got here through a random process of mutation and natural selection, which God simply got going 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And as a result, they think that we, with our intellects, are now able to correct the defects of this random evolutionary process. And so they are gung-ho to modify the genetics of food plants so that we can solve the problem of hunger in third world countries. Well, you probably know that almost all of our soybeans, almost all of our cotton, almost all of our corn is now GMO. And we have a prominent American member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences assuring us, quote, uh, go ahead, um, three slides to Peter Raven, please. Peter Raven assures us not a single one of the hundreds of millions of people who regularly consume foods produced by genetically engineered plants has become ill as a result of eating such foods. Now talk about God-like God knowledge. This man knows for a fact that there's not one of those hundreds of millions of people who's been adversely affected. Well, thank God there are scientists out there who dissent from this insanity. Dr. Richard Stroman is an expert in this area, and he points out that genes exist in networks. You don't just modify a gene and then you forget about it. That has just affected a whole host of other things, which in most cases we're not smart enough. Even our smartest scientists are not smart enough, don't know enough to understand all the ramifications. Next slide. As things stand, agribusiness, agribusiness corporations are not required to do any long-term safety studies with genetically modified food. And the studies that they do don't even have to be published. So, and it's very difficult, well nigh impossible, to get funding to do the long-term safety studies that ought to have been done before any of this was allowed on the market. So when Gilles Serolini, an expert in this area, got funding to do a two-year-long, long-term safety study feeding genetically modified corn to rats, the results were horrifying. Because the longer the rats were fed this stuff, the more their health deteriorated and they developed terrible tumors and problems with their internal organs. And this stuff has never been adequately tested. We're all participating in a enormous experiment that we didn't agree to participate in. And here's the really scary part. These people are not deterred by the work of Gilles Serolini, not one little bit. And they think that not only should they fix the plants to make them better for us, now they want to fix us. Because if we're the result of a random process and they're super intelligent, well then of course, they're gonna modify our genetics and they're gonna turn at least some of us into Superman. And that's what Father Teilhard de Chardin dreamed of before he died. What's happening now? Has that ever been part of what it is to be a normal human being? So why did we let these people get away with this? Because we abandoned the true Catholic doctrine of creation, that's why. And we need to come to our senses now and resist
before it's too late. Because if the people at the World Health Organization get their way, they will be able to dictate health policy to every government in the entire world. So I don't expect you to take my word for anything that I've said. Next slide. But I only ask you to make your own investigation. And we have a lot of materials that you can use to help you. But if you conclude that what we are defending is the truth, please do not stay on the sidelines, get into the fight. Because our goal is to get this knowledge to every young Catholic in the entire world. Jeffrey Dahmer was known as the Milwaukee monster because he murdered 17 human beings before he was about 30 years old. But what is really heartbreaking is that when he was on death row, his father gave him materials that showed him that evolution was false and that real science supports special creation. And because he read that, he had a sincere conversion to Christianity. And I've done a lot of prison ministry and I'm convinced that his conversion was sincere. But why? Why, next slide, could he not be taught what the little flower in every Catholic child in the history of the church was taught until very recently? And why are we allowing our children and grandchildren to be taught the same science that Jeffrey Dahmer was taught in our own schools. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.